So in North Carolina, as we've seen um, on the news, there's lots going on with body camera uh, legislation, not only in North Carolina, but across the country. Um, not only just in legislatures, but as well in the court of public opinion and what's happening. Um, so let's talk about, it sounds like, from this discussion. We want to keep it kind of light and be able to talk um, about the policy. And um, so it sounds like the public record part is the biggest issue. You know, people wonder if it's going to be, um, um, if they're going to see it, when they're going to see it, those types of questions. So if a body camera footage is made public record, what would be the, the pros of that? And I'm just going to let you all decide who goes first to talk after that. <laughs> Look at me, so I'll go all right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I believe there are some uh, pros uh, to releasing it, uh, and I'm, I'm sure sometime tonight we'll talk about personal liberty and, and some of those things. But uh, the question is talking about pros. I think sometimes uh, it can squelch or uh, alleviate uh, some uprising in a community. Um, it is it is a very difficult call uh, because I don't think that you can specifically talk about the pros without talking about the cons as well. Uh, but I do believe there are times where, uh, even we've seen recently in, in Charlotte, that there's almost a growing uh, suspense, what, what's hiding, what's being hid, uh, and it's sometimes magnified or blown out of proportion to the place where, had it been released, uh, then it may have squelched uh, more of the violence, more of the outbreak that we see. Balancing that... Uh, with individual liberty is the challenge or the thread or the needle that you have to thread through this. Uh, and even though it's become more populism, I guess, to say, well, just release it all up front, um, I believe that's an encroachment. It, it, the reason why, as a as a former pastor, I have been called to home sometimes when things weren't always uh, uh, where they need to be, and I'm sure much like gentlemen in, in the law enforcement, and there's there's been no crime committed, even though things have gotten a high rate. So uh, it is sometimes if, if, if a law enforcement, police or sheriff's deputy shows up, and that footage is called to be released, I, I think it's an infringement. infringement. Uh, the, only, the only solid pro that I see to it, from my perspective, whether it's the federal or even the local, is the fact that sometimes because there's so much unrest and there's so much discourse uh, on a particular incident that it may be to prevent uh, some kind of widespread further criminal behavior to be able to maybe squelch some of that. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to err on the side until, uh, whether it's the state legislation, until there's some kind of uh, decision making, uh, not being biased, not just on one side, superior court, whoever it might be, until then we need to continue to think about protecting people's privacy. I'll jump in. <clears throat> well, the, the pro that I see is very much in line with that, and that is that there's an opportunity to immediately dispel that vacuum where misinformation breeds. So the quicker you get information out, we, we live in a 24-hour uh, news cycle, and more, top, more important than that, there are, we've also got a 24-hour number of blogs going on a regular basis. People live on Facebook, Twitter. Um, the rate at which disinformation spreads um, far exceeds the need to retain the video in a lot of in a lot of instances. So I've had an opportunity to make phone calls to a variety of police chiefs uh, and, and sheriffs in, in my current capacity, and have this conversation about the, the pros for releasing that video. Uh, there are cons, and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get to that at some point. But the, the the larger part, from where I see it, is if you're not putting out factual information, and if you've got the capability uh, to demonstrate that those facts exist with the video, you're certainly setting yourself up to be in that information void where people will fill in the blanks. And that's just how the human mind works. We, we fill in the blanks when those, when those gaps exist on an individual basis, but more importantly, when you put that up in front of the media, and then the media brings in all the talking heads to speculate about what, what goes in that gap, there's more disinformation uh, that uh, tends to cause things to either spiral out, spiral out of the control, and more importantly, then you're, you're behind the power curve. I guess I'll jump in. Uh, I think we all agree that there's pros and cons to it. I think on the pro side of releasing uh, the tapes is the community's interest in uh, learning about how they're police department is treating people in the community, whether or not they're respecting constitutional rights or whether they are 
disrespecting uh, the constitutional rights of people in the community. So that's definitely over on uh, the pro side of things. There are cons. Uh, I kind of put the presumption uh, on the disclosure side. Uh, we can talk about how to handle uh, some of the privacy concerns and individual liberty and individual privacy concerns that do come up in this area. Go ahead and speak to the, you want to speak to the pros or the cons, go ahead and jump right in on that. I, I think it might, uh, I, I found in the many talks and programs and so forth we've gone through about this, that it's difficult to take the, the whole concept and deal with it. If you, if you break it down into its parts, it becomes a little more easy. So let me give you an example. When we st started working on this bill, we said, okay, where do we start? What do the police think? What do the citizens think? We, we had a, uh, uh, a large working group uh, that, that began looking at this situation because it was growing so rapidly, the technology was growing. So we said, where, where's, where's an easy step one for us to get started? And somebody said, well, I think anybody that's owned one of those images that has talked to a police officer or been a, accosted by a police officer or been helped by a police officer, that person ought to have the right to see his own image on there. And we looked around the table and everybody was sort of shaking their head this way. So a foundation part of this is that if you're in a confrontation or just a meeting with a law enforcement officer, or, or let me use an example, a real example. I ran into it in one meeting. This gentleman told me that his, his teenage son was a new driver. And he, his son came in one night and was very upset and nervous and, and sweating and almost crying. And he said, what's, what's wrong? What's going on? And he said, well, Dad, I hate to tell you, I, I got stopped by the police. And, and I, I hope I acted right. The, the, the police officer was pretty stern with me. And this young man was upset with this. He didn't get a ticket or anything, but he was upset with having been stopped by the police as a new driver. This father, if that happened, this father could take his son under this bill to the police department and his son being on the images under this bill has the right to see that part of the, of the, uh, the images that he's included in. And his father also as a designated uh, representative for him has the right to see that. So it opens it up as early as the next morning. Now, there may be some reason, uh, if it, in other types of cases, where a person, uh, where, the, where the agency would have to say, wait, we, we got to take some other action before we can show you this. In a case like that, though, or in a case where uh, uh, there was just an, uh, an argument between the officer and the, and the person about something, pretty easy for that to be handled by the, uh, the chief or whomever he is designated to. Uh, handle these all these images uh, to say, come on in at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Let's sit down. We'll let you look at this, and that's part of the bill, and that's sort of a guarantee to all citizens that they have a right if they're photographed, they have a right to see it, unless there is some investigative purpose that uh, would be supported by a superior court judge that says they can't. Absent that, they can see that. So that's the very bottom rung of the ladder we started working on, and then we moved up from there. One of the other cons to the video itself, um, particularly releasing it, is somebody has to go through that video uh, and, and basically uh, sanitize it. For example, uh, in the state where I come from, we, we don't release images or, or video that contains juveniles, period. We also don't release uh, video that contains uh, sexual assault victims or domestic violence victims. So we have to make sure all of those aren't, aren't even standing in the background of that particular video. And so there, there, is, a, there is that lag in, in that sense where you have to take some additional time uh, to make sure that video certainly fits within the parameters and, and doesn't violate any of the other parameters within, the, within that policy and or the, uh, the law of the state. Uh, so that's one of the downsides. Uh, to give you another one, uh, and again, in the state where I come from, if, if as the ink dries on any police report or that video is uploaded to the system, anybody in the state of Washington can now ask for it. 
uh, there is absolutely an expense for that. And right now I have a request for from one person for every single video from 1,700 police cars um, going back for the last two years. And so you can see pretty quickly that becomes pretty overwhelming for uh, an agency. And, and it's an expense, particularly within the state of Washington, that does not get passed on to the requester. So if I give you credit for addressing that. Um, I, one distinction I think that's important with respect to uh, privacy and some of these valid concerns that come up about people getting on tape and then who has access to the tape. One of the guidelines we're advancing is that when the police officers go into delicate uh, places, like go into somebody's home, uh, go into a hospital or go into a school where they're dealing with juveniles, then I think there would be a presumption against disclosure unless the guardians, the parents, uh, would consent to that. But I think for your typical traffic stop where things are out in public, then I think the presumption is in favor of disclosure, with some exceptions that uh, this gentleman mentioned. Uh, you know, if you're talking about a, a woman who's, you know, they're about to interview a woman who's been sexually assaulted, if that's out in public, I think that would be an exception. Uh, the police officers come onto the scene of uh, hor horrible accidents where people are traumatized. That would be an exception. But I think in the run-of-the-mill common traffic stop situations, the Sandra Bland case got a lot of attention, uh, that type of scenario, then I think there, there's a presumption of disclosure, not only for the, the person who is caught on the image, but for members of the public, members of the media, I think uh, we should err on the side of disclosure so that, again, police departments usually say they're conducting an impartial investigation. Uh, the pro of these cameras and this footage is uh, actions to demonstrate that they, that they are. The why body cameras are so popular across the political spectrum is that it does uh, give like an impartial witness to what has happened uh, in, in that scenario. There's limitations to these uh, 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 cameras and to some of the footage. It's not always clear, but sometimes it's clear enough. Like in the case of uh, Walter Scott in, in South Carolina, Michael Slager is set to go on trial uh, at the end of this month. That's the case you might recall where Walter Scott was shot three times in the back. Uh, the officer's uh, side of the story was that he had to shoot because he was going for his taser. Unbeknownst to the officer, the bystander was filming with his cell phone camera, and uh, we saw that Walter Scott was running away from him and was not going for the taser. And then there was that disturbing footage where he seemed to be throwing his taser, you know, tampering with evidence after the shooting had taken place. So in some cases, the footage is going to be subject to interpretation, but in other cases, it's going to be clear enough. And that's why uh, uh, it makes all the difference in, in some cases. I would, uh, Perry, you kind of surprised me. I, did, I didn't realize that uh, there in the state of Washington that somebody could make that kind of request. I believe that, uh, to me, I would add the con that that's, that's an overwhelming burden not just in manpower, but also in expenses. Uh, today I was sitting down with them speaking at a uh, first responders uh, event at a school here in the area, sitting down with four uh, sheriff's deputies from Forsyth County. And they were telling me they are 39 positions short right now. Uh, they have a, they cannot fill. And the more that we're putting on law enforcement, even though we need to go after rogue people and prosecute to the fullest extent of the law, there's no question they need to be exposed. And for people to deny that oppression and in places discrimination still exists, in my opinion, is very ignorant. Yet at the same time, we're asking more and more and more of these young folks who obviously for the great the statistics show the great percentage of these are wonderful young people and similar people as well, I guess. Um, but we want to make sure that, that we are being balanced when every action that they have, uh, whether it's language or whether it's other things, I would advocate a con would be that unless there is some kind of uh, accusation uh, by the perpetrator or by the victim, however you would want to describe it, I think we've got to get to a place where, uh, and I think this ties into the privacy element or aspect as well, whether it's weekly or monthly, 
uh, deleting that data, uh, some kind of automated way where you're not burdened to be able to carry that. And, and most of the time within a week, or you want to say 30 days, if no one has said, hey, listen, there was no wrongdoing here, I think that's a common sense to be able to wipe the thing clean. I think it helps with both the privacy as well as uh, uh, supporting, if you will, uh, some of our law enforcement, whether it's in, in the county area, whether it's the state level, whether it's the local municipalities. We have to also make sure that we're posturing ourselves to say we're looking out for the law enforcement who, for the most part, are doing a fine job. Um, Keystone, who was supposed to be here, who was the sheriff of Nash County, was not able to come due to flooding in Nash County, and we did not want to take him out of Nash County. I've met with him several times. He's phenomenal, and, and that's a question he continuously raised to me. He said, you know, if it is public record, Angela, how am I going to pay for this out of my budget? And correct me if I'm wrong, Representative Fairclough, to my knowledge in North Carolina, if there's no charge we erase the record after 45 days if there's a misdemeanor we keep it three years and if it's a felony it's 20 i think it is and, then, and it's up to the state archives but i think those are about the right dates that's uh th there there are some different steps for that right. and it, it the, the records uh, laws in north carolina govern that mm -hmm. as they do other other records of any type but some of these could be, end up being kept kept in, kept indefinitely uh, so uh, we are talking about, Mr. Congressman, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars over time for, for storage. And, uh, and we're just at the beginning of this. This is a developing uh, program, and so this is something that uh, we've got to be aware of as we work on one hand with trying to have a, a workable system. We've got to have an affordable system that... Uh, that is good enough, but doesn't throw money away. That's what we always try to look for in appropriations anyway. Uh, if I could, uh, to, to sort of take another step in this bill um, and, and to touch on some of the uh, publicity, both uh, uh, some, some we would prefer not, not have happened and some that we were glad did happen. So we have instances where um, uh, something has happened, the police departments have a confrontation perhaps, and the, the public is getting upset with it. They are calling their council members and they're saying something needs to be done, the police are running wild, whatever the case may be. And um, uh, we, we, will, we needed in working with this to find a way, uh, uh, as simple as possible, for a city government to react to questions about an incident. And uh, uh, we also, as a part of this, we wanted somebody who was sort of the, the neutral arbitrator for all of these situations. And in our case, it's a Superior Court judge. So the, the chief of police is not in control. Uh, the judge is not in control. The judge is simply there to make a decision of what other folks are doing. The council's not in control. Um, it all depends upon what the situation is. And let's, let's take one where uh, the, the council members are getting the calls from the citizens and they're very upset. Uh, they want to see these images that, are, that they know are there. Uh, under the, prior to October 1st, under our old laws, uh, it uh, was very difficult for a city council to work its way through uh, working with the police department on how to finally release these. Uh, there was an earlier act several years back that if a council found that it was in the best interest of the city to release them, they could do that. And so they had to work their way through that. It was a very sort of a cumbersome situation. What we have now is the images, uh, an officer gets off in the evening from his shift. He, whatever the uh, procedure is, he turns those images in, makes the appropriate records and what have you. If there's an incident that was turned in by an officer, it, it obviously goes into the file somewhere and somebody is managing that in the system. And if that is the incident that's beginning to uh, raise interest, then the, the chief of police is responsible at this point and uh, he obviously has access to this. In our bill, Everybody in his administrative structure has access to the bill as well. So he can call any group of officers together 
and say, let's look at what we have here we, and decide which way we want to go with this. So maybe they talk about it and the chief says, this is a little bit bigger than me. Uh, let me. Let me call the police attorney over. The police attorney is a part of the administrative structure. And so under this bill, the police attorney can join in this discussion. The, uh, the, the police attorney looks at it and says, well, I think there's probably a reason that we might want to get the council involved in this. Let me talk to the city attorney. The city attorney is by, by function also a part of the police administration. So the city attorney can come in without getting permission from anybody, simply by being asked by the chief, and join in this conversation. If they then say, this is too big for us uh, for to, to hold in-house. We've got to, something's got to be done. So they call the manager in. The manager is also in that administrative structure. So the manager can immediately become a part of this. Under the old legislation, all this was very awkward. Um, the, man, the, the manager going through all this may say, this is so important that I need to go talk to the council. And uh, so he goes and talks to the council and he comes back and says, we've decided that the council, the mayor and the council members should have access, to, should be able to view this image. And uh, so all it takes to get that to the council then is one piece of paper that the city attorney or the police attorney walks over to the Superior Court Judge's office with, usually pretty close in most towns in North Carolina. And it, it's a... Uh, Let's see what the language is. I haven't had it. Petition for release of custodial law enforcement agency recording. The judge, they go to the, the attorney would go to the judge and say, "This is what we have done. We think that the council, we think the council needs to be aware of this. It's in the best interest of the city. There are no objections at any point, so uh, the judge will sign it. They can then sit down with the entire city council or one at a time, however they want to do it, and involve the council." And the council at that point may say, we've got to release this. It's too hot, it's getting out of hand, we've got to release this. The same process then takes place if the council says they want to petition the judge to release it publicly. So the same simple process goes forward. Now, in each of these cases where the judge is involved, there are certain things he has to consider. We've talked about some of those. Is it, uh, is it going to be dangerous for a juvenile? Is it going to be, uh, is there something on there that's embarrassing for somebody? Is several things that the judge would consider. And if a judge found that it was appropriate to release it as, as requested, he simply would sign the order and that would take care of that. That's mu a much more simple process than the, you've seen some of the uh, other situations we've had before that lingered on so long. And this will speed all of that up if, it's, uh, if people will simply take advantage of it. What I have found is that many people haven't looked at the bill and understood what the processes within the bill uh, allow to, to realize that it's a step forward in uh, having the public be a part of the policing in its city.